Hi there and welcome to A-Level Politics. I'm Mrs Harris and I'm subject leader for politics here at Chesham Grammar School. Um, so the purpose of today's session is to introduce the course to you and to have a little look at some of the current issues in UK politics right now just to help you get to grips with some of the things that we'll be doing. So I think it's worth considering what politics actually is because you won't have studied politics at GCSE so it will be a new subject for pretty much everybody who's taking it. Um, politics actually is multifaceted. It's hard to give it a simple or singular definition. If you were taking history, I could say to you, well, history is the study of the past. But with politics, I can't really say um, in one sentence what it is. Some people have said, you know, we can reduce it down to it's who gets what, when and how. And that might be a good way of thinking about politics. So it might be um, that politics is associated with making decisions um, in groups. So that could be holding elections or holding referendums, the way we distribute power in our country uh, or say between our sort of United Kingdom. Um, or it might be how the government has power um, at national and local level. But also politics can mean sort of power relations between individuals, whether that means sort of the boss of a company and their worker or a husband and wife, um, because politics can be sort of personal as well. You've got this, this phrase, the personal is political. So that's sort of what it is. It's about how we make decisions and sort of where the power lies. That's what politics is. And I'd like to congratulate you on making the decision to study politics because I genuinely believe that there couldn't be a better time to study politics. It's so exciting right now. It's so relevant and it and it will continue to be important. In so I suppose the first question on your mind might be, well, what will I be studying? So you can see on this slide here, I've laid out exactly what you will be studying at politics A level. So it consists of three components. Component one is about UK politics and you can see the list of um, topics that we study here. So this is all about sort of how democratic are we, how do our political systems work, um, electoral systems, so, so how do we form a government with our electoral system, what other electoral systems are there in the UK because we don't just vote in general elections, we vote in all sorts of elections, maybe ones you haven't even heard of before like police and crime commissioner elections, that sort of thing. And then we look at voting behaviour. So why do people vote for the Labour Party or for the Conservative Party or for a smaller party? Um, what factors feed into that? And how does the media feed into that decision as well? And we also look at core political ideas of liberalism, conservatism and socialism. So this is sort of ideology. What does a conservative think? What is their worldview? And that's actually more complex um, than it might first appear because there's a spectrum of belief within all three of these ideas. Then we do um, UK government, which is in component two. And uh, again, this is in year 12 that we'll study this. And this is really how our things run. So when we look at the constitution, we're looking at um, that interplay between England, Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales. You know, who has what power? How is power distributed here? Um, you know, how much power does Parliament have? How much power does the judiciary have? And so on. We look at Parliament. We look at the Prime Minister and the Executive. And we look at the relationships between the institutions, including the EU. And that big question that still hasn't gone away, but I, I think it's I think it's about to <laughs> give it a year. OK, which is all about. How much power does the EU have? Has, has the EU taken power away from the UK? And we do a topic here on feminism as another sort of political idea. And again, we look at all of the different sort of spectrum of belief in feminism. And in year 13, we look at the United States of America. Now, this is a comparative um, politics element. So we're always comparing America or the USA back to the UK. So we look at their constitution. And then we compare and contrast it with ours. We look at Congress, which gets compared and contrasted to Parliament, the presidency, Supreme Court. 
we look at democracy and participation, so this will be elections, and they have many, many more of them in the United States compared to here. And we look at civil rights and civil liberties as well. And that would include things like the Black Lives Matter movement. So it's very, very sort of modern, up-to-date course. It's all exam based. So each component, you'll have a two hour exam and they're worth 33% of the grade each. There's absolutely no coursework whatsoever. And personally, having taught now for <laughs> over a decade, I really feel like this politics A-level is brilliant. It's, it's such a fantastic A-level and the exam, I think, now I'd never say an exam is easy. I wouldn't want to, to say exams are easy, but I think the exam is very manageable because one of the brilliant things about this A-level is you can use information from any of the learning in the three topics in any of the exam. So you might be doing your exam on sort of the USA, but really you'll be able to go back to the stuff that you've learned about the UK and talk about that. You might be doing your exam on component two about the UK government, but you can, and you have to actually to get the grades, you have to say how it links into component one. So it's very cohesive, it's really nice. And our students do really well in politics. They really, really do achieve very, very highly. Um, and that, that's obviously down to their hard work, of course, but I really do think that the exam very much helps with that. So I thought we'd move on now and we'd have a little look at the, the kind of thing that you might be learning about when you come back in September. Now, obviously, this is different to usual. Um, normally, we make sure our lessons are very, very interactive. We like to have lots of debates, lots of discussion. Um, we like to get you doing a lot of the research during the lessons. We've got a whole suite of iPads for that. Um, but <laughs> due to the nature uh, of, of COVID-19 in the context at the moment, this might be a little less interactive than usual. In fact, it definitely will be if you're watching it back now. So it, it won't be exactly like this when you join us in September, but we definitely will be studying this sort of thing. Now, the thing about politics is, is that it's very up to date. It's what's happening now. And therefore, we do need to keep up to date with the news um, weekly, preferably daily. And so I thought a nice question to ask at the moment would be, how likely is it that Boris Johnson will achieve his aims? I think this is a really good question to ask right now, because, of course, Boris Johnson was elected not very long ago, less than a year ago on this promise of getting Brexit done. And what's happened is that he's been thrown into this situation that none of us could have expected, none of us predicted, none of us would have known about. And I think the question is, you know, will he be able to achieve his election pledges now? Or will what has happened with COVID-19 and, and the coronavirus, will that really prevent him from achieving his aims as prime minister? Will it change the course of his premiership? Will it be good for him or not? And I think that's a really sort of lovely question and we can bring in sort of different elements of our course to um, think about that. Now, you might know a lot about Boris Johnson. You might be an expert on him already or you might not know anything about him. This is a brand new subject. I wouldn't necessarily expect you to know a lot about politics right now. I would expect you to go and learn it as we go through our course. So I thought I'd just do it. Boris Johnson, before we get into the, and will he be able to achieve his aims, considering everything that's going on right now. So this is Boris Johnson. There he is. And he actually was born, uh, I hope I pronounced this right, his name when he was born was Alexander Boris the Fefel Johnson. There you go. And he was born on the 19th of June, 1964 in New York. And he was given the nickname Al. That's um, what his family called him. Now, he had a really uh, unusual childhood, kind of unstable, I suppose. Uh, he moved house 32 times in 14 years because his father had this career that took him all over the world. He was actually deaf um, until he was eight years old. So he, was, he had glue, glue ear, which made it very difficult for him to hear anything. 
Um, and he was actually quite a subdued child. And his mother, very sadly, actually had a breakdown as well. Um, so his childhood was, was sort of very unusual and strange. But he, he famously once said that he wanted to be world king. That was his ambition. He's very, very famous for saying that as a student. So that, that's his background. Now, he ended up being sent to private school. He went to prep school first in England and then he went to Eton. And it's really when he goes to Eton, and you can see this picture of him here that I've put up on the PowerPoint, that he sort of starts to cultivate this image um, that we all know today, this image of Boris Johnson. He changes his name to Boris. He creates this persona that's eccentric, that's, that's bumbling. Um, so this is sort of the beginning of Boris, really, when he's in Eton. Um, so obviously Eton's a top private school and he then went on to study classics at Oxford. So he actually won a scholarship to Oxford. He went there in 1983, but this is sort of the classic route. And this actually builds into some of the things that we'll be looking at in politics, this idea of elitism. And that is the idea that perhaps even now, even today, uh, the people that end up in charge, the people that end up with the power, were the people who were born into the money, were born into the wealth. And this is sort of a classic route to go and be prime minister or go and be an MP, private school like Eton, and then off to Oxbridge. Um, so there you are. But that was certainly his journey. Um, he got, a, obviously, as I already said, a scholarship. He became a member of the infamous Bullingdon Club. And this is a, a sort of a club where... Um, well, I suppose it was a drinking society for all the elite um, and they're sort of infamous for sort of casual vandalism and for, for bullying behaviours, things that perhaps we might find distasteful now, not acceptable. And um, he did actually try to become involved in, in student sort of politics when he was at Oxford. He tried and he failed to be elected as um, president of the Oxford Union. So perhaps he uh, learned some lessons from that. Apparently he hardly did any canvassing at all. After leaving Oxford, um, he got married um, and he's had a number of, of marriages and the speculation about the number of children he had. Um, and he also went and worked as a journalist um, for the Times. And actually he's been, a, uh, it's been said he was given sort of the low grade journalism, the lesser work. Perhaps he was unreliable. And um, certainly the Times thought that was true because he ended up being sacked from his job at the Times for making up a quote. And he had attributed this quote to his godfather, um, a man called Colin Lucas. And Colin Lucas actually phoned the editor of the Times and said, that's a lie. I didn't say that. Uh, Boris Johnson has made it up. And Boris ended up being sacked. But that didn't that didn't stop his career. We all know that he ends up. So we have a look at what happened next. Well, what happened next? It's very simple. He went and worked for the Daily Telegraph. And really, this is where he started writing a lot of stories about the European Union. Um, stories that suggested the European Union was sort of sinister or that anything coming out of it was sort of lunatic. Um, and he started to become a household name in the UK sort of moving towards being a celebrity. And actually, as he was continuing to work for the Daily Telegraph and the Spectator, he started appearing on programmes like Have I Got News For You? So he was sort of becoming a personality. Now, I've written here that Boris Johnson courted some controversy um, when he was having his sort of journalism career. And that's definitely true. He, he has used colourful language, um, Perhaps that's a euphemism. Um, things that I actually don't really want to repeat on this on this PowerPoint, so you can go and look it up for yourself. So people have accused him of using racist language or derogatory language when describing sort of minority groups or experiences. Um, and he also had a friend called Darius Guppy who was convicted of fraud and there was a leaked tape where um, Boris Johnson was agreeing to help Darius Guppy, um, and that got him in quite a bit of trouble. He courted quite a bit of controversy, but he found that actually his persona 
where he sort of laughs things off and ruffles his hair, he found that that was quite a good way to deflect from all of the controversy surrounding some of his sort of less less salubrious friendships, perhaps. He then became an MP for Henley. He was still working. He was writing for The Spectator at this time, so you could argue that it was perhaps a con- conflict of interest there, but there we are. Um, and then he got sacked again um, because he lied about an affair that he had. He was on rather callously there, wife number two by this point, a woman called Marina. Um, so yes, he becomes MP and then he gets, you know, sacked for lying about this affair um, that he was having. At the time, the Tories were having sort of a, a family values by which they meant sort of relationships within within a marriage kind of drive. It wasn't, it wasn't, it was hypocritical, really. Um, so he had to go. He then became the mayor of London. Now, by this point in time, um, David Cameron had actually become the leader of the Conservative Party. So David Cameron, obviously, he was an old Etonian as well um, and Oxbridge graduate. But um, David Cameron did not put Boris Johnson in the shadow cabinet. It seemed like Boris Johnson's political career perhaps wasn't going to go anywhere under David Cameron um, at all. So he sort of jumped at this chance to um, campaign and become mayor of London. And he won. He won that in 2008 and again in 2012. Um, They had some real real highs. You probably still know about Boris Bikes. And here he is. This is it. This is very famous uh, picture because this is the London Olympics. And of course, this is where and I highly recommend Googling it or having a look on YouTube. This is where Boris Johnson gets stuck on the zip wire. So he actually hung on the zip wire for quite some time <laughs> like that. Um, but, you know, he was just himself. He just made lots of jokes about it and he's, you know, very affable. So some people think, well, he had some brilliant successes as the mayor of London. And for balance, other people think that, well, actually, he he wasn't particularly good. He wasted lots of money. There was a, a garden bridge that was never built, but a lot of money was spent sort of designing it. And, and that he didn't have a real plan or vision for London. But there you are. So, you know, I suppose he's still a figure that divides opinion, like he has been his whole life. It's Then he becomes an MP again. He becomes MP for Uxbridge. And um, David Cameron's won the election uh, 2015 at this point, outright with a majority. And David Cameron has decided to hold a referendum on membership of the EU. David Cameron held that referendum because he he thought that Remain would win and that it would put the issue to bed and th- then it would stop anybody in the Conservative Party from sort of wanting to leave the EU. Now Boris Johnson probably became the deciding factor in Britain leaving the EU. He's this sort of big personality, everybody knows him and famously he, he wrote out sort of two columns for a newspaper setting outside the argument uh, for both sides in the EU referendum. So one saying, oh, these are all the reasons why we should remain. And the other saying, oh, these are all the reasons why we should leave. And in the end, he decided that, um, obviously, to campaign for the leave side. And that was very sort of controversial. It was really shocking at the time. David Cameron probably very disappointed. And we all know, don't we, that leave won the referendum. And it was this real sort of triumph for for Boris Johnson, he'd come down on the on the on the side that won. Now <laughs> there was then um, David Cameron resigns from from being leader of the Conservative Party, and there was this sort of fight for power. Now this might have been Boris Johnson's moment to become the leader, but it wasn't because Michael Gove. Don't know if you've heard of Michael Gove, but you will uh, be hearing of him if you study politics or when you come back and study politics, he said that Boris Johnson would be unfit to rule. These two men sort of fought it out amongst themselves and then sneakily up behind them came Theresa May. Theresa May had been very, very, very quiet during the EU referendum. She was a Remainer, but she wasn't a very vocal Remainer. And uh, she really hedged her bets there quite well and she emerged as leader. Now, we know that didn't go particularly well for Theresa May. Um, She did, however, make Boris Johnson foreign secretary. Uh, That was a surprise to literally everyone. 
probably even to Boris Johnson. Um, so maybe it was a case of uh, keep your enemies close. Maybe it was a case of, well, actually, Leave did win. Let's have some levers in the cabinet. We don't know. Um, people have regarded him as a pretty abysmal foreign secretary, probably one of the worst in history. Um, he made a number of gaffes, meaning that he couldn't stop speaking or he would say the wrong thing. And I think the most famous one was uh, Nazanin Zaghari Radcliffe, who's still being held in prison. Um, people say this as a result of Boris Johnson's words. Um, and he actually resigned as foreign secretary anyway in protest um, at Theresa May's, uh, Theresa May's Brexit deal. Uh, he described it as a turd. So they are using his colourful languages as usual. Now, we all know that it did not go well for Theresa May. She ha held a general election thinking that, oh, she definitely beat Jeremy Corbyn in a decisive victory in 2017. And she did not at all. Um, <laughs> she lost her majority. Um, and the position became untenable because she couldn't get her Brexit legislation through Parliament. She resigned. Boris Johnson, he emerged as this as, as the leader of the Conservative Party, finally. And then he held um, an election last year in 2019, in November, and he won. So that's who he is. That's Boris Johnson. Now, we're thinking about, is he likely to achieve his aims? you know, as, as Prime Minister, considering the context now. Um, so first we need to have a look at his election promises. So here they are, get Brexit done. That was the first one, very simple. And the next one was to forge a new Britain and you can see it on his sign there. Get Brexit done, unleash Britain's potential. That's what he was gonna do. Now what he meant by that was he was gonna increase the number of nurses by 50,000. He was going to provide a billion pounds a year to fund social care for the elderly. He was going to raise the national insurance threshold. So the, the point at which people start paying tax. He was going to provide wraparound childcare. He was going to upgrade homes and make them environmentally friendly. He was going to fill potholes. This is the popular policy. People are fed up of potholes. And he was going to spend 500 million a year for four years to do that. He was going to set up a national skills fund of 600 million a year for five years. And he was gonna build a Northern powerhouse rail and he was going to renew the relationship between government, parliament and the court. So that's what he said he was gonna do. Thinking about how likely it is that prime ministers or governments might achieve their aims, we've got to think about the things that will hinder them, the things that will prevent them from achieving their aims and the things that will help prime ministers to achieve their aims. Now, I've got a list of things or factors that might either help or hinder a prime minister running down here. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. This is not the only thing, um, but they are external pressures, such as the state of the economy and any unforeseen crises, having a strong majority in the House of Commons, the ability to control your cabinet, so everybody else in the government, can you control them? Uh, the popularity of the prime minister, leadership style and foreign policy and international affairs. Now, if you are watching this back at home, it might be a good idea now to pause the video, stop listening to me speak for a bit and think, hmm, what side would you put them on for Boris Johnson? Okay, so um, external pressures such as the state of the economy and any unforeseen crises you know, well, we are currently living through some of that. And um, so maybe that will stop Boris Johnson from achieving his aims. So just have a think about what side you will put them on. OK, or maybe you could go back and think of any other prime ministers who has been um, had really sort of a massive, strong majority in the House of Commons. Hint someone like Tony Blair. I mean, he had loads and loads of Labour MPs in the House of Commons, 418. He was essentially able to pass any laws that he liked. So that would definitely have helped someone like Tony Blair. How does um, Boris Johnson compare to that? So maybe pause the video here and have a think. What side would you put them on? Right, welcome back. Maybe you haven't paused the video. Maybe you did pause the video and think about which 
side you put each thing, things on, but I thought we'd go through them now and have a look at some of the current things that Boris Johnson has to contend about. Now, external pressures such as the state of the economy and any unforeseen crises. Now, here we are. <laughs> You can see that for Boris Johnson, I mean, he's got a lot of external pressures, the state of the economy, oh dear, and unforeseen crises. Yes, there are a few, aren't they? So obviously, we are now currently living through a global pandemic, COVID-19. Um, and there are lots of problems for that with Boris Johnson, because some people are saying he has had a weak and slow response. To COVID-19. What does stay alert mean? What are you and are you not allowed to do? Um, does, is anyone going to listen to the message anyway and stay at home? And should the government have acted earlier to prevent the spread of the virus? So this is really sort of a massive distraction on this time. He's also got other sort of things happening here like Dominic Cummings who's one of his special advisors, um, people, people, some people think that he broke the law by driving to Barnard Castle to uh, test his eyesight, um, and then you've got all sorts of things as as a as a result of COVID nineteen with the economy, like the furlough scheme where people are being paid by the government, even though they're not at work anymore because the the businesses that did employ them cannot afford to pay them. Um, things like schools, what's going to happen with schools, all of this. And then, of course, feeding into this, you've got this, this um, building tension at the moment in Britain with, with Black Lives Matter and the agitation and the, and the movement to, towards making sure that people achieve full equality um, in the UK. And so this is all going on. And I really, really urge you, if you haven't already, to go watch the panorama on the killing of George Floyd. It's, it's, uh, I mean, I, I've taught politics for several years now and I watch panorama every week and it was one of the most sobering panoramas I've ever watched. And I think it really gets to the heart of the matter. And it's, it's so worth a, a, um, a watch because this is an issue that isn't going to go away, shouldn't really go away and is so relevant for politics A-level. It's only half an hour, that's Panorama BBC. And so he have got a prime minister who was, his, he was elected on Brexit, I'm gonna get Brexit done, and now he's having to deal with all this sort of crisis. So that might stop him from achieving his aims. Over here, having a strong majority in the House of Commons, well, this helps the prime minister. So the House of Commons, that's where all the laws are made, and there are 650 seats or MPs in the House of Commons. So to control them, you need to have um, 326 of them in your political party. So Boris Johnson actually has 364 Conservative MPs sitting in the House of Commons, which means that all the laws that the government proposes are likely to get passed because the majority of the MPs are Conservative. So this is fantastic for him. It's actually fantastic for the Conservative Party. It is the sort of best majority they've had since Margaret Thatcher back in 1987. If we compare it to Theresa May, well, she had 317 in 2017. That's not very many. If we compare it to David Cameron, he, he once had to form a coalition government with the Liberal Democrats because he didn't have a majority. So this is good. And we can see that Boris Johnson has already put, passed legislation that others couldn't, like the Brexit withdrawal bill. That's done. It's gone through. We're leaving. We're in the transition period. So that's going to help him achieve. Now, <laughs> moved on to the popularity of the Prime Minister. I put him up here. Boris Johnson, in general, you know, very popular, obviously very electable Prime Minister in general until COVID-19 happened and this is the thing so I would link his popularity now to COVID-19 I imagine had COVID-19 not happened if it hadn't struck the UK he would still be a very very popular prime minister but his approval ratings are going down some would say plummeting okay so 56% of people in June in a YouGov survey thought that the government was 
handling coronavirus badly, he's actually got the lowest worldwide approval rating for his handling of the coronavirus. People think Trump has handled it better. So I'll just I'll just leave you for to digest that for a second. And then, of course, we've got the opposition leader, Keir Starmer. So, of course, Boris Johnson, when he was elected, Jeremy Corbyn was the Labour um, leader. And Jeremy Corbyn was, despite despite having a lot of support within sort of like his party, not the parliamentary party, but within um, sort of the, the sort of grassroots of his party, Jeremy Corbyn was probably unelectable. Yes. I've said it. Jeremy Corbyn was unelectable. And therefore, so when, when Boris Johnson was elected, of course he was going to win. Of course he was. Um, that wasn't a shock to anyone who follows politics. But now you've got Keir Starmer, who's a bit more sort of uh, centrist, I suppose. Um, so it has, a, has more of a broad appeal than Jeremy Corbyn did. And Keir Starmer's approval rating is going up and up and up. It's gone up 20 points. Um, but Boris Johnson, he's still um, one point ahead of Keir Starmer in the polls. If people had to pick a prime minister today, they would pick Boris Johnson still, but only just. Now, will that hinder his ability to do anything? Well, maybe not, because he's got a strong majority in the House of Commons. He's going to be in power for another few years. We're not going to have another election for quite <laughs> quite some time. It should be in another four years time so mm, I don't know but uh, maybe I don't I think he'll be there but you know he'll need to do something to regain popularity I think Moving on, we've got the ability to control your cabinet ministers now I think Boris Johnson has good control over his cabinet actually I put some of them there that's not all of them there are more but maybe if we're looking at Rishi Sunak down here, now he actually replaced um, Sadhu Javid with a reshuffle in February 2020, back before anybody even really realised how serious COVID would be. Um, and this is really Boris Johnson consolidating power. All of these people um, actually, maybe, maybe Matt Hancock, I imagine, might go in the future. <laughs> but all of these people... They, they really were selected because they were people that Boris Johnson could get on board to achieve his agenda. And that's a good thing. You don't want troubling people in your cabinet. Maybe it was a complete mistake for Theresa May to put Boris Johnson in her cabinet. Why would she do such a thing? <laughs> it's not helpful to her. Um, so he definitely has tight control over his cabinet. Previous prime ministers haven't, you know, there was a prime minister called John Major back in the 90s and he really had trouble controlling any of his ministers or getting them to do anything he wanted. They constantly undermined him. So I think Boris Johnson there, he does control his cabinet. And not the cabinet, but the civil service and the civil service of the people who are not meant to be political and they're meant to do what the government says. Boris Johnson actually is doing uh, control, whatever you think of this, he is moving to control the civil service as well. So he, he um, this week, a bloke called um, Sir Mark Sibyl, um was replaced with somebody called David Frost. It's been quite controversial, but it does mean that there's a high level of government control over the civil service. Foreign policy and international affairs. Mm, yeah, these, these things can often hinder a prime minister from achieving their aims because, of course, we have no control over foreign policy. And in your course, there are a couple to watch. First is Trump. Now, Trump is up for re-election this year. It's election year in America, which is why you have definitely selected a good year to do your politics A-level. The question is, will Trump win? Okay, will he win? Or is he going to lose? Now, if you'd ask me in January, is Trump going to win? the 2020 presidential election, I would have said yes. I'm not as sure now. Um, I think we, we, we will need to see. I think COVID has changed the situation because it's changed the economy. So I'm, I'm not sure. I, I also, I did think he would win in 2016. I thought he would win in 2016. Um, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a surprise to me that Hillary Clinton lost. 
And if you read her book, it's on the reading list, What Happened? <laughs> you can read her book and, and tell me, do you find her relatable? Because I'm not sure. I'm not sure that many people did. And, and we'll unpick this in our course as well. Um, anyway, so, you know, Trump and, and Boris actually fairly good. Um, I don't know if friends is the right word. But certainly like allies and Trump actually said that Boris Johnson would make a good prime minister of the UK. Um, but there we are. But Trump's an unknown quantity, isn't he? He's a maverick. Um, will he give us a trade deal that we want? We don't know. OK. And then, of course, you've got the EU because this is Boris Johnson's whole thing, isn't it? He wants to leave the EU. Um, but he would like to have a um, sort of an agreement with the EU. Will that happen or not? Who knows? There's lots of um, rhetoric, so people speaking about what will happen or making threats. I wouldn't read too much into those. That's how negotiation works. Sometimes you make threats like, oh, we'll leave without a deal to, to, to make the other person act. So I'm not sure what will happen there. But some of it might be beyond Boris Johnson's control. But I wouldn't say this is a big deal, you know, at the moment. At the moment, we've got more pressing things to deal with. Harris, you've been cynical. You're basically saying that mm, Boris Johnson, he's not going to be able to get anything done now because of COVID-19 sort of derailing all of his agenda. But actually, I don't, because I actually think that sometimes a crisis is a catalyst for change. What I mean by that is, is that sometimes what happens when you've got something like COVID-19 or you've got a crisis, is it, it, it makes people reflect on their lives. It makes people reflect on society and actually it can sometimes be a good thing if you think about Britain for the last decade it's all been about austerity not spending any money right well what we can do now is we can spend a lot of money to recover from COVID-19 there's a there's a reason to spend the money now and Boris Johnson recently um, a couple of days ago um, pledged to build, build, build. He wants he wants a new deal for Britain. So if we go back to his election promises, get Brexit done. Well, that seems like it's going to get done. Okay. Well, we, we've left. We're in the transition period. So that will get done. What it will look like, don't know. But we can give it a big tick. Forge a new Britain. Well, he wanted to do all of this stuff, didn't he? But now is the right moment. To, to really be ambitious, and that's what he's saying. So, any history students, you may or may not have heard of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and, and his New Deal, which was back in the 1930s. America was in a real sort of economic depression, and Delano Roosevelt just spent loads of money, loads of money, to recover America from the depression to provide jobs for people. And Boris Johnson is pledging to do something similar. His critics say, well, it's nothing like, it's nothing like the New Deal that Roosevelt did. Um, but that's what he wants to do. That's his vision, to spend money on hospitals, roads, to rebuild schools, towns, have green reco recovery, plant loads of trees, be innovative with technology, build new homes and ooh, strengthen the union, as in the union between Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales and England. So I actually think that once this is over, and it will be over, I think he has a fair chance of delivering on his election promises. Um, it does depend on this being over and it does depend, I think, on the on perhaps being able to um, know exactly where this virus is and to be able to perhaps tackle it at a more local level. But I do think that he probably still has a fair chance, hmm, maybe even a better chance now because the economic situation has changed and he can justify the spending in a way that perhaps he wouldn't have been able to do before this. So there you are. In class, obviously when we're doing this in school, there'll be a lot more discussion. It won't just be me talking through a PowerPoint for, well, it's it's 39 minutes and 24 seconds now. So there'll be a lot more discussion. But those are the sorts of things that we'll be looking at. And I personally think it's really exciting, all this sort of stuff about what's going to happen now what, and what's going to happen in the immediate future. So the question for you is, what do you do now? What happens next? Now, the first thing I'd like you to do is, oh, that's a typo, oh dear, sorry, to complete your A-level preparation work and your summer work. 
I, I have, you know, I've got a degree. I, I know that this is wrong. Do accept my apologies. But could you complete your A-level preparation work in your summer work? You can find it all on the school website if you're wondering where it is. And it's a really um, good sort of introduction to studying politics. And it will give you sort of the foundations to start studying. So we definitely want you to do that. I've put on the school website as well a reading list. Now, I cannot encourage reading enough. Reading, and bear in mind, this is a, you know, a grammar school, is what is going to enable you to think deeply and properly about everything that we're studying. And there are so, so many good books on that list. One that I really recommend is Hillbilly Elegy. I think it's fantastic. It is about the United States. It's about why do, why do poor people vote for Trump? And um, the bloke who wrote the book comes from Michigan. He was really poor growing up and his family were dysfunctional and they'd always voted for the Democrats. And this man, who um, J.D. Vance, who wrote it, he's unusual because he managed to escape his background. He managed to escape the poverty of his of his family life and he becomes a lawyer. And he really sort of analyses through his family history why his family stopped voting for the Democrats and they started voting for Trump. And it's really good. I couldn't recommend it enough. So pick one that you're interested in. Um, maybe start with something light if, if you don't read that much. But definitely, definitely, you should be reading a book over the summer. And I will be asking you when you come back, what book did you read over the summer? I want you to tell me about it. I love reading. I love reading books. So, you know, <laughs> that's, that's what you need to go do. Now, you can also follow me at CGS AS Politics. AS obviously stands for A Star uh, on Twitter. That's one of the things I'd like you to do. And I will start tweeting some sort of relevant news stories to A Level Politics. I'd like you to start watching and reading the news. Now, when you come back to school, we do a lot of um, reading of the news. I won't make you sit there with an entire newspaper, but I like to do once per week a comment section from the Times where, where I photocopy it for you and we sort of analyse it and we think about, you know, who wrote it, what are they saying and what are the arguments against it. So we'll be doing lots of that, but broadsheet newspapers are good and try and get a variety. You know, the thing about politics sometimes is people just read read the things that they agree with, it becomes an echo chamber, chamber. So if you're sort of left and liberal, you might read The Guardian and then you just read The Guardian and you never get exposed to any other views so maybe try and read the telegraph as well for the contrasting view if you can access the newspaper if not just watch the news just watch it okay maybe watch it what I would say every day would be you know when you're in the lead up to your final exams but you know twice a week would be good if the news is boring for you if you don't like watching the news you should not really be taking politics a level politics a level really is the news. It's what's happening right now. Okay, so it's so important to start watching the news. And some other programmes that you could mention, uh, watch as well, things like Panorama, things like Horizon, lots of documentaries on Netflix. Um, they are really, really good. And actually, we, we run a politics society here, and we run a politics documentary club as well. So you could watch them we run those every week so you can come in at lunchtime and you can watch a, a politics documentary but I, I would certainly say that there are some really good ones out there and they're definitely worth watching um definitely panorama it's only half an hour a week I mean you've got a lot of time right now I'd, I'd get on that if I were you when you come back in September when you come to school in September you need three folders three sets of ten file dividers and the folders need to be labelled component one, component two and component three. We're starting off with component one. So just bring in your component one folder um, in September, please. But you do need, you will need three folders overall. So obviously you can revise from the different folders. And um, yeah, the only other thing to do is return in September feeling uh, refreshed and ready to study. That's all I want you to do, really. So that's it from me. So I'm really looking forward to meeting you. I hope that gave you sort of a, a brief insight into the kind of things that we will be studying next year and what you can do to help, help yourself um, prepare. So good luck.
and I will see you on the other side.